Today with us, we have Dr. Uh, Thomas Scalia. He is a distinguished professor in trauma and globally recognized for uh, pioneering a leadership and advancing field of shock and injury, injury care. Uh, just a few reminders, as every session, uh, we urge you guys to have your cameras on to you know, facilitate conversation better. And also just um, to know that the uh, session will be recorded. Uh, that's all. Uh, Dr. Skula, you have the floor. What you want to talk about? Don't everybody start, speak at once. To start, uh, can you please describe how, like, your profession and any sure. experiences you had? My name is Tom Skula. I run the R. Adams College Shock Trauma Center at the University of Maryland. It's the only freestanding trauma hospital that exists anywhere in the United States. It's been in existence for about 50 years. I've run it for just uh, about half of that time, 24 plus. Uh, I came from New York City. This is the only job in the United States I would have left New York City to take. This is, uh, if you do what I do for a living, running shock traumas, similar to playing center field for the Yankees. It's as good a job as exists. Um, we deliver more injury care than anybody else in the United States. We admit about 7,500 people a year, do the arithmetic, that's 20 something a day. Uh, the Maryland system, which is unique in the country, is really based on, on a pyramid with the shock trauma center being at the top. So there are layers of level three and level two and even level one trauma centers were actually designated at a level above level one. We are the primary adult resource center for injury care in the state of Maryland, which is about 6 million people. And so the, the trauma triage protocols drive uh, all of or almost all of the badly injured people to over to our shop. If you read any thing in the lay press, you realize that Baltimore is a sadly an incredibly violent city. It per capita homicide rate in Baltimore is either number one or number two in the country virtually every year. Do some, if you make some comparisons, a couple of years ago, you might have seen in the New York Times, the kid, uh, the black kid with the sign that said, please don't shoot me. He was from Chicago. And they were talking about the, the incredible epidemic of homicides in Chicago. It was 800 homicides on a population base of 2.5 million people. Last year, we had 350 homicides in Baltimore on a population base of 600,000. Twice the per capita rate that exists in Chicago. And so we stay very, very busy taking care of people that are victims of gun violence and other types of interpersonal violence. We see a huge volume of what we call blunt trauma, vehicular crashes, people hit by cars. It's really busy. And so, um, you know, one of the beauties, I think, about doing this as a living is you never know what's gonna happen, right? It's quiet, it's quiet, it's quiet. And then the, the sky opens up and it rains uh, badly injured people. And you know, then we go to work and so yeah, I love not knowing what's gonna happen. I love always having to be ready. I love having to bring our A game every day. There's no such thing as a night off. There's no such thing as it can't happen because not only can it happen, it's probably going to happen. And um, we take care of we take care of everything. We take care of kids. We take care of adults. We take care of older people. We take care of everything. Would you say that you are limited to where you can work because, um, like, you have to work somewhere where there's a lot of crime? No, not really. I mean, um, the specialty is called acute care surgery. So we, our group takes care of 
all types of surgical emergencies. I like doing trauma, so I do that more than anything. But the other guys in the group, and our group is uh, 25 men and women. We take care of, cover the emergency department for all surgical emergencies. We take care of trauma patients. We work in the intensive care unit. So everybody wants, everybody's looking for one of us. Everybody wants somebody that's going to, you know, take care of that stuff because lots of people don't like doing it. So the fact that there are those of us that A, like it, B, are willing to work the schedules, it's kind of, you know, you don't like working nights, this is a bad thing to do for a living. Because guess what? Half of the times you're at work are nights. It's not quite true, but you got to be willing to work some nights if you want to do this. So, um, but you, there's a job everywhere in the U.S. doing this. And the rest of the world for that matter. I have a question. Yeah. Um, what do you think, well, I have two different questions. One, like, what is your, like, Go to most significant story, especially because I feel like being in the ER, I mean, not the ER, acute care is like you probably have a lot. And then how has it changed since COVID, like before and after? What has been like the biggest significant difference? Yeah, you know, I, I, I've been doing this. I know I look young, but I'm really old. And so I've been doing this a huge amount number of years. And, um, the one that I, that always comes back to me is there, this goes back about 10 years, maybe a little bit lo longer. I get a call. I was on call. I get a call that says, we're going to bring in this girl that fell off a golf cart. And I said, you're kidding me, right? You're going to call the helicopter for some goofy 16 year old that fell off a golf cart. They said, she really needs to come. I said, okay, fine. Bring her along. So she came in and she had the worst brain injury, the worst from falling off a golf cart. I have no idea of why. And one of the things about bad brain injuries it affects the whole body. This girl was 16 years old at the time and her lungs failed, her heart failed, her kidneys failed. She had terrible pressure in her head. She got unbelievably sick. And in order to manage her, we made stuff up. This was stuff that nobody had ever done before. So at one point, and I would always go out and talk to her parents who were both psychotherapists, which made that an interesting dynamic. And I'd say, well, you know, we're gonna do this, but if that doesn't work, I got a plan. And so we would do it and would work for a while and then it would stop working. I'd say, okay, we got another plan. And they'd say, well, what happens if this doesn't work? I'd say, that's okay, I got another plan. And um, in order to manage the pressure in her head, we actually put her on a table and stood her straight up. Not even not lying in a bed. She is now standing straight up on this tilt table so we could drop the pressure in her head. And we opened her abdomen in the ICU to release the pressure in her head. And her, the pressure in her head kept getting worse and kept getting worse. And I said, uh, I'm out of ideas. I know what to do. So I literally went down to my office. As a, there's this wonderful lady that I'm not, she doesn't work for me. I think I work for her. And I said, Stevie, don't bother me. I can't. And I went, I walked in and I closed the door and I said, I'm not walking out of here until I fix this, until I figure out what we're going to do. And um, it took me about four or five hours. And then I said, I got it. And I went upstairs. And one of the reasons the pressure in her head was so high is her lungs were so filled full of fluid that the pressure in her chest was high and that raised the pressure in her head. It took me five hours to figure that out, but I finally, I finally got it. And we, st I stood on a ladder. This is the honest to God truth. 
and to put a line in her, the, the big blood vessel in her neck. And we put her on cardiopulmonary bypass in the ICU and turn the ventilator off. Now we could use the bypass circuit to get, you know, to do the work of the lungs, kind of like dialysis for the lungs. Nobody had ever done that before. And it worked. She ultimately recovered. She woke up. She went, she turned down Yale to go to Vanderbilt for college. Ult ulti ultimately became a nurse practitioner. I still see if she just delivered her first child, I talked to her and her parents at least uh, two or three times a year. Pretty cool. A and it's one of those things where, why is this such a cool thing to do? Because we don't, you know, we solve all of our own problems. I operate in the neck, I operate in the chest, I operate in the abdomen, I do vascular surgery, I do everything. And um, I love being able to solve every problem. We call for help sometimes, but not that often. And so the ability to be able to solve problems everywhere in the body, I think is in, incredibly uh, powerful. I love doing that. And um, it's one of the best things about the job. Now COVID, COVID uh, here, here's a big surprise. COVID's not been that much fun. And uh, yeah, it, it changed first, the violence got worse. I didn't think that was possible, but it did. We had a very small decrease in the volume, and then it came back in spades in everything. And of course, you know, it's if you work in a place that only takes care of COVID, you know they have COVID, right? Do you work in a COVID ICU? Everybody there already has COVID. So you know that. So everybody wears the space suits and everybody, when they come to us, nobody knows if, we don't know if they have COVID or not. So we have to assume that they do. Well, I gotta tell you, wearing all of that PPE and the double masks and the gloves and all of that makes it a lot harder to do the job. But, so it's just taken a, things that are sometimes difficult and made it infinitely more difficult. We've got all of the bays where we admit people are wrapped in plastic and, you know, every, we had to, we literally, in order to communicate, because you can't hear anybody with those masks on, we write in magic marker backwards. So the person on the inside can read what it is we're writing. We, we take uh, medicines, put them in a little basin, pull the plastic up and kick it in. That's how we get medicines. And so we, we, made, we invented all of this because we needed to, right? We needed to be able to still work, but we had to completely redesign the way we did things. And it's, um, it's just a huge amount more complicated. And it, it's really hard because you want to just go running into help. But you got to say, oh, no, I need to stop. No, I don't care how sick this person is. I have to put on the mask. I have to put on the gowns. I have to wash my hands. I got to do all of that stuff because you don't want to get sick. And sadly, I did get COVID in December. I would not recommend it as a good way to spend a couple of weeks. I was really sick. And, you know, so I get why we're, we're doing this. It just makes it, so, it's against our instincts, right? My instinct is to run in, not run out. But I gotta wait before I run in so I can put all the junk on. So I wanted to ask you, I guess, what led to your interest in doing such a 
kind of crazy specialty and a specialty that's always busy and that's always really demanding kind of maybe what experiences led you know you to make that decision to uh, find your home in this specialty black and gold vcu are you yep. in richmond i just recently graduated in august of 2020 and i'm in the northern virginia area right now yeah i went to medical college of virginia that's what we're that's the real name of it many, many, many years ago. Very awesome. fond, I'm, I'm actually, I know the president at VCU and the dean in the School of Medicine very well. We, we don't talk all the time, but we talk more than every once in a while. I love it. Love That's it. awesome. It's a great place to be. Yeah, so I'll tell you a story. I didn't plan for any of this. I left, uh, when I went to college, I had this distinct memory my mom said, what, what do you think you're going to do? And I said, I have no idea of what I'm going to do, but I know what I'm not going to do, and that's medicine. And I, um, I went to the University of Virginia for undergraduate school. The only, and why did I go there? Because I wanted to play college football and get a good education. And I'm not a very big guy, as you can see. It was They were ranked 149th out of 150th for division one schools. I figured that I could probably play ball there and, uh, and still get a good education. So that's why I picked it. And I had no idea what I was gonna do. I didn't, I was one of these things called an Eccles scholar. So you didn't have to have a, a major. So I sort of meandered through college. And I finally, uh, I found what I loved which was experimental psychology. And so I, this guy who was, he said, well, you come, you'll go to graduate school. You'll be in my lab. I said, fine, I'm done. I got my, my life plan is made. And one of my friends came up and said, I bet you can't get into medical school. And I said, bullshit, I bet I can. So I applied to medical school on a dare. And um, I finished college in January. That would be a semester late, not a semester early. And um, I went to work in a factory to make some money. About May, I got rejected from graduate school. So I called the guy up and I said, remember me? The one that's gonna be in your lab next year? And he said, oh yeah, things changed. I guess I should have called you. So now I'm working in a factory. I got, I've been rejected. I only applied to maybe three medical schools. I'm re rejected at in graduate school. I end up, um, I get into medical school. I get into MCV. So I thought about this for a while and said, you know, working in a factory or medical school, let me think about that. Medical school seemed like a good idea, so I went. And um, I went through medical school, loved it. Like four best years of my life were in Richmond. And I, um, but I couldn't find out what I wanted to do. And so I am now getting ready to graduate, right? I'm, I've got to apply for residency. I have no idea of what I want to do. And in, and so I applied, to, they, they don't exist anymore, but years and years ago, everybody was an intern. And when you were an intern, you did two months of OB and three months, you did everything. And then you started your residency. So I said, I guess I, there were two of them left in the country. So I said, I'll apply to those. And in August of my fourth year of medical school, I met this guy, I worked, I spent a month in the medical ICU and his name, he's still there, he's still in Richmond. His name's Barry Fowler. He's a very well-known professor of medicine. And he and I were in the medical ICU together. And I said, I, this is great. I wanna be like him. He's, you know, this is what I wanna do. So I applied, I said, I must wanna be an internist, right? Cause that's what he was. So I applied to some internal medicine at the end, at the very end, I applied to a couple of internal medicine places. And um, 
I end up matching at one of these rotating residence internship things. Okay. So I go there and I say, I really want to turn this into a medicine residency. And they say, fine, they try to make me into a primary care doctor. And I hated it. So now I'm, I've only got a one year gig, right? I don't have a residency. I just got the internship. I picked surgery because it was the only thing that was left after all of the, I said, well, I don't want to do medicine, I guess. And I don't like OB. And I, so I said, surgery, I guess that's what I'm going to do. So I applied and I got a job. And the first month of surgery, I did transplant. And I met this guy named Richard Burleson. I said, I want to be like him. I want to be a transplant surgeon. So that's what I was going to be. I was going to do transplant. And um, when I was a chief resident, I still have his picture up in my office. That's how powerful an influence he was on me. He had the bad taste to get lung cancer and die. Like, die quickly. And I said, I don't want to do transplant with anybody else. I want to do it with him. So I had no idea of what I was going to do. It's the 15th. So I figured maybe I would just get a job and be a community surgeon. And there were these groups in Syracuse where I was a resident and nobody asked me to join their group. So it's the 15th of May. I'm going to be unemployed in six weeks. And um, this guy calls me up from New York and he said, I hear you're unemployed. I, well, that's in fact, correct. Thanks for reminding me. And he said, well, we have this fellowship in critical care. And one of the people, it was the only one in the country, I didn't even know existed. He said, one of the people that was gonna do it just dropped out, do you wanna come down and look at it? So once again, I considered my options, unemployed or doing a fellowship. Fellowship seemed like a good idea. So I went to New York to do this fellowship and um, I loved it. It was great. And I loved New York City. Loved it, loved it, loved it. And so I said, I'm going to stay in New York. And um, I'm looking for a job. I can't find one, one that I like. <clears throat> and my boss, who I have his picture in my office as well, he, um, he, comes up and says, I'd like you to go look at this job in Brooklyn. And I said, I'm going to go I want to go to Brooklyn. Cool people in Manhattan. And he looks at me, I'll never forget this. He says, Tom, do you, uh, do you know where Brooklyn is? I said, yes, sir. He said, do you have a car? I said, yes, sir. There were no computers at that point. He said, do you have a set of maps? I said, yes, sir. He said, do you think you could find Kings County Hospital? I said, yes, sir. Then he looked at me and said, then why are you still standing here? And I went down and I walked into the county and I said, I'm home. That's where I want to be. And I started doing trauma because that was the surgical practice that went along with the ICU. So I never actually decided to do this at all. And I just, it just happened. It was better than being unemployed. That was always my, uh, my fallback position. And it's been great. I just can't imagine what else I would do now. I mean, I'm, I'm way too old to change, but um, it's, been, it's been the most um, gratifying experience of, that I could possibly imagine. So do, I have a question. Yeah. Do all trauma, so do all trauma surgeons, do they, do they uh, work in the ICU then? And do yeah, uh, the, the training specialty, the fellowship, the after you do a surgical residency and the fellowship is in critical care. You can do one year of critical care or two years. The first year is critical care and the second is more operative, but Almost of all of the people that do the critical care fellowship, 70% of them do trauma. 
So that's sort of the way in. Yeah. Now, people do different things when they finish. Some people spend more time in the ICU. Some people spend less time. Like me, I love doing trauma. So that's what I mostly do. Most of my partners like doing emergency general surgery. So they do some of that. You, you can, there are lots of options depending on where you work and what the, ne the needed stuff is. There's lots of ways to do it. I have a question. Yes. Why do you think um, surgeons get such a bad stigma attached to them? Or do you think the culture of surgery is changing as far as like what them having- <laughs> What are you talking about? Like they say that surgeons are like impatient no. or mean or rude. No, that's not true. I think I that, mean, I think some surgeons are. Um, I think that, I think that's changed a huge amount in the last five to 10 years. I think the, um, the training, when I trained, I worked 120 hours a week. I, you know, nobody, we had no rights. You stayed until the work was done. There were times when I was on call, I would be in the hospital 30 something hours. You know, we got every other night, which really turned out to be about 36 hours on, um, 12 hours off. It was a very um, physically and mentally and emotionally challenging way to live. Mm -hmm. And I think some people responded by not being that nice. But I, you know, that's changed now, right? Everybody, there's the 80 hour work week. So you can't work more than that. There's a great attention to wellness, to find that as you like. Um, and, and there are, uh, there's real attention played, paid to um, being sure that the, that residents are cared for as well as them caring for people. And so I, I really don't think that, um, I think the training has, has changed a huge amount. Now you guys, you guys are a completely different generation from me, right? And the things that you value are different than the things that I valued when I was your age. It's okay. It changes the way I do things. You know, that's on me, that's not on you. And so I, I, I think that many of those um, concepts about, or the stereotypes, they're kind of, they're a little bit outmoded. There are still some, you know, the cardiac surgeons are, uh, but you know, some of them are and some of them aren't. Okay. So yeah. I, I don't, I, you know, and when people say, oh, I could never do that, of course you could. You should do what you love. And if what you, you love, you think you want to do is to do surgery, you should do surgery. Okay. There's a job for you. I don't care how it is you want to leave, live. There's a job for you in there somewhere. Just got to figure out what that is. Maybe you don't want to do what I do. Okay. I can't, I don't know why not, but. <laughs> Maybe you don't. And then you should, you just got to find your way to, you know, you, you walk that path and you find your way to your place. Thank you. So how would you um, I have a question. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Who's got a question? Somebody just said um, they did. I, I have a question. Yeah. Have you ever had a surgery that you felt you couldn't accomplish or finish? No. I, I, I say that so definitively, but the answer is no. Um, in order to do this, you have to be arrogant. You have to believe that you can do it. You, you have to be arrogant and being you know, a jerk about it. But when somebody comes in and they're really, really sick 
And I look at that and I say, wow, this is, you know, this is an injury where 95% of people don't survive. What I say, this is the 5% that does. Because you have to believe, right? You have to believe that, that you're going to be able to pull this off or you get paralyzed with fear. Now, it doesn't always work, but um, I do think that what I do, there's nobody else there, right? At three in the morning, I'm there by myself. And I'm what's between that patient and living or dying. And so I have to believe I can do it. Because if I can't do it, there's nobody else there to do it. And so I, I, I do think you have to be fearless to do what I do for a living. You have to, you have, to have a little chip on your shoulder. Baloney, I, I can do this. Well, I don't, what do you mean? I got this. Because if you don't, then you get in there and go, oh my God, this is terrible. It, you don't have the luxury of, of saying that. The patient deserves you saying, I can do this. You got to have it. You got to be able to do that. Or you should go do something else. You know, and, and this is lots of, there are lots of surgical disciplines where you go see somebody and then like cancer, right? There's a tumor board. Everybody sits around. They say, this is what we think. It's a great way to take care of cancer. And if you had it, that's what you would want. I don't have a tumor board. I got me. There's nobody there to say, you know, if I were you, I would. It's me. And I can call for help if I need it. But at this point in my life, the number of times I don't know, I might have trouble getting it done. But I pretty much always know what we need to do. Almost always. What do you do like in the moments where it's like almost always like that point where you don't know what to do? What is like the first step you take? I'm sorry, what you said? You said like there, like almost always I know what to do, but like in moments where you don't know what to do, what is like the first step you take to like with I, that girl when you were sitting in your office yeah. being like, I don't know what to do. And you just sat I there. step back and I, um, and I think even if I only have two seconds, I try to use those two seconds well. So you gotta kind of cone in and think about the problem. You got to really sort of focus. I actually had um, a question about your work-life balance uh, and, you know, whether you ever struggled with that as a surgeon and how you really balance that, that sort of dynamic. Yeah, I'm a bad person to ask that about. I, I don't, as one of my... Uh, my chief of trauma said when she was uh, describing me, it's hard to have work-life balance if you don't have a life. And I work, that's what I do. That doesn't mean you have to do that, um, but it's what I do. So I still work a hundred hours a week. Um, I love it. I immerse myself in it. It's, it's who I am, it's what I do. But almost nobody else does that. So if you wanna know about that, you're gonna to have to ask somebody else. Got it, thank you. I have a question. Yeah. What is one thing when, you, when you're about to um, perform a s surgery, what is one thing other than, you know, that, Five percent. If you're the, it's like a little path. What is one thing that keeps you going to know that you're gonna like you're going to succeed in this procedure? 
I just think you have to believe. Okay. You just have to believe. You have to believe in you and believe in the people that are there to help you. And, and um, you just got to believe. How was your first? How was your first procedure? How was it? <laughs> you know, that's so far. Uh, that's so far ago. I don't even. I'm not sure I could remember. Them. I, you know, I, I did a residency. I did a fellowship. I felt pretty confident when I finished. Like I, I knew what I was doing. I'm not sure I did, but I thought I did. Hello, I have a question. Yeah. Um, I wanted to know, I know that you said before that you're not the person to ask the question, basically, what do you do outside of work? Yeah. But um, like, do you ever find yourself stressed or like overwhelmed with hours? And I know you say you immerse yourself in work, but like, um, since you work in trauma surgery and you see so much trauma daily, um, like, how do you, um, how do you relax? How do you decompress in your regular life? I do two things. I spend, uh, it's harder in COVID now, but I, um, I spend, I, I try to get some exercise every day. So I try to get to the gym for about an hour. Mm -hmm. And, um, I cook. Okay. <laughs> Cooking is a wonderful thing because you can't rush it. Right? If you're supposed to bake something for two hours at 350 degrees, you can't bake it at 700 for one hour. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work that way. So you have to slow down. Okay. Thank you so much. And I, I find that very relaxing. So how do you distinguish? So if some, I know it's very common for somebody to, uh, to be kind of undecided between emergency medicine and trauma surgery um, because, because they have an interest in trauma care, um, which, um, so how would you kind of differentiate, how do you like uh, explain to somebody like how to like, how would you to decide on which specialty to choose? And like, well, what's the responsibility? They're very different specialties. You know, EM cares for only the first hour. And so it's, you know, it's a thing, right? But then you get out of the way and, and the people that are going to care for that patient for the rest of their life take over. I care for them from the moment they get there all the way through. I like that. But and the emergency physicians do so much more than, than trauma. They do, you know, they take care of heart attacks. They take care of belly aches. They care, take care of GYN stuff. They take care of a lot of non-trauma non stuff. Matter of fact, the tra their trauma practice is really a very small percentage of what they do. So what would you say? Um, I, oh, sorry, go ahead what would you say would be your least favorite part of the job or like if you could change anything, what would that be? That's easy. The least favorite, my least favorite part of the job is going to tell some mama their kid is dead. It's part of the job. Yeah, that's, that's pretty heavy. It's the worst, it's the worst part of the job. And everything else you would say is is enjoyable and fulfilling. I, yeah, I, I like it. I mean, you know, listen, sometimes do I get frustrated? Of course I get frustrated. Do people piss me off? Of course people, you know, don't act the way I want them to act or something. But on balance, I have a great job. And I, um, you know, the patients, I, I think what you, if you're a doctor, almost any kind of doctor, but you're having a good day. The patients are having a bad day. So why you would complain, I don't get it. I have a question. Um, 
so we've talked about like your success like in retrospect but yeah. what what have you done in order to prepare yourself for medical school just because i know um, you mentioned that you got rejected from graduate school but um, getting accepted into medical school is um, quite a lengthy process so i was just yeah. curious yeah you know, i just went to college i i didn't think about it a lot frankly i you know i i took I had interest in, in the biologic sciences. I was good at them. So I took some of that. Uh, I had interest in math. I took a bunch of math. I, I had interest in um, the humanities. I, I took a, a lot of uh, writing and reading courses. It was great. I just did what I felt like doing. All right, I have a, a follow-up question. Oh, I have a follow-up question. So during a pandemic um, right now, how would you um, say that we should prepare for medical school? Because I'm uh, looking to apply this year for a 2022 application cycle. Yeah, you know, everybody asks, you know, how, how do I maximize my chances of getting in? And, and the answer is you do well, all right? You, you can scheme about, you know, doing this shadowing or doing that. All that's okay, but it doesn't replace good grades and good MCAT scores. You do well in school, you do well on the MCATs. You kind of get in. Now, listen, if, if you and your twin brother or sister have... Um, the same application and one of you has extra stuff and the other one doesn't, the one with the extra stuff gets the nod. I got that. But if you have lousy grades and your twin has good grades, it doesn't matter how much shadowing you've done. It doesn't matter about all the extracurricular stuff. Good grades and good MCAT scores are the, you know, the prerequisites. Dr. Scalia, there's a question in the chat from Evelyn Hall. Uh, she says, um, how do you cope with the losses when you're not successful with the surgery or when you have to tell someone their loved one didn't survive? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's the worst part. Um, you have to just go say it, you know. Um, there's, a, there's actually a, a science sort of to giving bad news. And the truth is, they don't care who you are. They don't care if you're the intern or the professor. What they want, what they need is um, direct conversation that gives them the information. So talking around it and saying, oh, we did this, we did that, they don't care. What they're hoping you're going to say is that everything's okay. And what you have to say is, I'm sorry, we did everything we could, but your son died. And nothing matters other than that. Um, and the truth is, you're still on call. You're not done for the night just because somebody died. So you need to be able to get your head back in the game immediately because the next person deserves everything that you've got. You can't feel bad. So you have to be able to compartmentalize those feelings. And then when it's your time, you can go do what you have to do to make the bad feelings go away. But not on their time. And everybody's got their own way of doing it. So do you take call from uh, from the hospital? Do you, like, you have a call room at the shock trauma center? Yeah. It's way too busy. You can't call. Right. It's, there's never, there's never, it's never slow enough. You think about going.
I have a question. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so what impact would you say that your what impact would you say that your pre-med years had on you as a doctor right now? I I don't know. I think your pre-med years get you into medical school. I don't know that they do a lot else for you. Uh, I I don't know that other than going to college is a kind of a maturing experience in some ways, I guess. But I, I don't know that what I did in, in my pre-med, the pre-med portion of my life actually had anything to do with much of much of anything, really. I have a question. Uh-huh. So um just wanted to know, I know we talked about how, how do you deal with losses and stuff, but I'm not, not sure because I came in a little late, like with your family, how does your family cope with everything? Yeah, I, I don't have a family. I, okay. So, uh, I mean, I have a family. I don't have any children. And so um, that just isn't, hasn't been part of something I've had to deal with. Okay. Thank you. You guys are out of questions. We're coming down on an hour anyhow, that's fine. I do have a kind of quick question. So yeah, so how do you balance you guys' high, um, trauma surgery? Um, uh, your cases in the trauma center and the uh, ICU um, coverage? Yeah, it's, you, 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 what you do is you do them in blocks of time. So if you're going to be in the ICU, you do a week in the ICU. And that's all you do for that week. If you're going to do a week of trauma, you do a week of trauma. And that's all you do for that week. Gotcha. And so... You trauma surgeons, if they wanted to, they could just do work in the surgical uh, trauma ICU or just yeah. focus on trauma? You could. It's an option. Gotcha. Marcus, I have you another question. Something? Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yes, my next question is, do you have any um, PAs that um, are with you while you're doing your surgeries? We do. Not so much in the operating room, but I have NPs and PAs that are part of the service that help take care of the patients. Yeah, lots. Okay, great, thank you. So my question is kind of going off of that. You were talking about how um, a lot of this like rests on your shoulders and your decisions in the moment. So um, is this a very like team oriented Completely. spec? Or is right. it no, 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 trauma is the quintessential team sport because I'm the captain of a, a team of people, but you know, they're orthopedic people and they're surgical people and plastic surgeons, and sometimes the urologists that have things to, that come in and help us take care of the patients. So, it and then within the on my service. I have a postgraduate fellow, I have a bunch of residents, I have a bunch of medical students, emergency medicine residents, surgery residents, all types of residents. And so it's a it's a very, very much of a team. So very you work alongside, alongside many, many different types of doctors, more so than other specialties might. Yes, M much more. So does the uh, emergency department ED physicians, do they come down to the, um, when there's a trauma, do they, which I guess is consistently traumas. Uh, yeah, we're trauma. set up a little differently. In most places, the emergency medicine people are in the ED, right? And then the patients come in and the trauma people come down to help take care of them. All right, guys. Well, thanks for letting me be part of your evening. Thanks a lot. All Thank right. you. Is there any? Thank um, you so last much. Minute? Thank is you any, so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.
Happy to do it. I do have a question, actually. All right. Last question. Go ahead. Oh, will um, uh, just kind of shot in the dark. Would would we be able to um, get like your email or some way to contact you just if we have any further questions? I don't know. Okay. Or is that? Uh, no, it's okay. It's T S C A L E A at S O M okay. School of Medicine dot U Maryland dot edu. Oh, uh, got it? Yeah, my my um, what's it called? My internet glitched. Um, would I be able to find it on on the website or? I have no idea. <laughs> Could you repeat, repeat it one more time, sure. please? Dr. Scalia, you could send it to us and we would be happy to put that on our website. All right. I don't know how. Oh, I can email you guys back, right? Yep, that's perfectly fine. All right. Also, I just want to add, guys, that we put the quiz link and the pre med scene link tree for where all our resources are. Um, if there's, uh, are there any last minute questions or is that it? Yes, um, is the quiz like on social media or is it on the website? It's on the website. You have to go to, I put the link in the chat as well, but you can go to the programs tab on our website, I believe, and it should be in the virtual shadowing. Okay. Yes, the quiz okay, will be opening, you. the quiz will be op opening shortly. Um, I know it says it's no longer accepting responses. It'll be opening. I just shortly. sent the email. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Scalia. All right. Okay, thank you. Thank you guys for attending and have a good night and stay safe. Good night. Good you night. too. Thank you. Thank night. you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you sir. Bye-bye. Great story.